the key hermeneutic of the Bible, this is one of the most foundational things of all discipleship. You need to know what this book is about. It's about a person, and his name is Jesus, who has rescued us and who is seated at the right hand of majesty and all things are beneath his feet. And though the devil is boasting as if he's in control down here, he is defeated. Thank you so much for joining us on this special edition of The Good Fight Radio Show. With us today is author, pastor, teacher, Eric Ludy. We are so excited to welcome you to The Good Fight Radio Show. Thanks, Chad. I'm glad you uh, didn't include loudmouth. Uh, sometimes that gets included in there. So that was really nice of you to exclude that. Yeah, maybe I can do that in post-production for you, but uh, <laughs> but but nonetheless, uh, that's no problem here. We we like to to talk loud too, and we're excited about Jesus, and that's one of the things that I think uh, myself personally falling in love with a lot of the teachings that you have given over the years that I can't wait to talk about with you. Maybe some of the inspiration behind some of those things, because uh, I think a lot of times people see videos, some of your videos having millions of views on them, uh, by, by about sermons, which is pretty awesome. You know, when you really think about that. And I, I think there's always a lot of things going on in the background with a lot of those teaching the Lord's working on people's hearts before they deliver those important messages. So we can get into that. But I guess just to start, I, I got to know, because you do have a, a passionate uh, cry, a passionate call that you give so often in many of the messages that I've heard there at Ellerslie Mission Society and Ellerslie Church, which you pastor as well. And I want to know how somebody who's so passionate for discipleship, passionate for the gospel, how was it that you were brought to the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, thanks for asking. And I think that, uh, you know, determining someone's root system is always fascinating in the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, I grew up in a, uh, I, would, I would even call it a strong home, even a strong Christian home. But I didn't really understand uh, the vibrancy, the, uh, the life empowered and so the kind of Christianity I was growing up around, though it was marked by integrity and high character and a desire for uh, living this uh, New Testament life out, it really didn't have the power to do it. And I, so I lived a rather marginal existence growing up. It sort of looked like the world around me. And when I was in college, my sister uh, gave me a book for Christmas. My sister had gone radical uh, in my mind, and she was weird. Uh, she, you know, her her senior year in high school, she was sort of rejected because she was hanging out with all the foreign students and the disabled students, and it was totally embarrassing to me. Uh, and but she was going after Jesus. She had discovered something full and rich. And she, then instead of going off to college like she was supposed to do, that's just what a good Ludi would do, uh, she uh, went to the mission field. And so then for Christmas that year, uh, she gave me a book. And she was actually at the time teaching Keith Green's kids, if any of you uh, remember uh, the musician Keith Green. Uh, so she was teaching his kids. And uh, Melody, his, his wife, who was now widowed because Keith had died in a plane accident in 1982 or 83, uh, she'd written a book called No Compromise, and she had it signed by Melody and gave it to me for, for Christmas. And I, I just remember looking at the cover and going, this can't be that good of a book with that cover. Uh, it's just sort of a drawing of Keith Green with a big mop of hair on top. And I was thinking, oh. And But I took it up to college with me, and it sort of haunted me on the bookshelves. You know, I was thinking, why did she give me this? And so I pulled it down and I read it. Uh, it was in my first year of college. And all I can say is it totally transformed my life. Uh, I discovered something in watching Keith's life that impacted me. And that was, he had the simple thought, if Jesus gave everything for me, then shouldn't I give everything for him? And it was like it, that logic seeped into my soul. And I remember agreeing with Keith Green. And I just said, yes, he deserves my life. And here it is, Lord. And that was February 2nd of 1990. I remember it very, very well because my life was changed. Even though I'd grown up in, a, in the church, I don't even like thinking about anything before that. You know, one of those things like, well, would you have been saved back then? I don't even like asking the question to old Eric, you know, back there and say, hey, how are you doing? You, you think you're going to heaven? I don't even like the question. I just know that I encountered Jesus Christ in a way that transformed me. And I remember the first call I made was to my sister. And I said, uh, 
Chrissy, and she she was sort of shocked to hear from me. I didn't call her, uh, and uh, she said, "Eric," uh, and I said, uh, "I gave my life to Jesus," and all she did was cry. That was our entire conversation: is me listening to my sister cry. She prayed for me every day for years. And uh, I've oftentimes thought the toughest nuts to crack are oftentimes those closest to us. And I was a tough nut and I cracked. And Jesus came in and my life from that moment forward, uh, I would call it radical. Uh, I, I started praying in my dorms. I had a, you know, it's like we're praying for revival in Eric Ludy's dorm room every night. I'm going door to door on the on the. Uh, through my dorm and, and inviting people to Bible studies. I didn't even know anything about the Bible, really. I had grown up in the church, really didn't know anything. Uh, but I wanted to share what I had, even though it was very imperfect. And that was the beginnings of sort of the, we could call him the loud mouth, uh, the guy that uh, has a lot to say about Jesus, even though I've had a lot to learn along the way about how to share uh, about Jesus. So that's that's the beginnings, Chad. I don't know if that gives you enough of a a root system for me, but Keith Green was impacted by Leonard Ravenhill. Uh, and so I wanted to know who Leonard Ravenhill was. And so you, if he was, you know, I, I remember finding A.W. Tozier the same way. All these different men that are now a part of what I would term my root system and the way that I think, and the way that I, I reason biblically came out of that time. You know, it's really interesting you bring that up because uh, at our own personal ministry, at Good Fight Ministries and Blessed Hope Chapel is the church attached to it as well, I had come across your video on, uh, I think they called it Brave Hearted Thoughts, and that's just T-H-O-T-S, if I remember correctly. And it it had come, it was just an amazing video. You had taken this this video, this, this sermon from David Wilkerson, and that sermon was a call to anguish. And I really think that really hit the church in America. And it was pretty, I guess it was pretty awesome to see. It was just out there and a bunch of people were talking about it. And still to this day, I'll, I'll travel places. And people be like, hey, have you seen that call to anguish video? I'm like, yeah, that, that was right. That came out right after I came to the Lord. And one of the things that was so awesome is you're mentioning Tozer and Ravenhill. And these are the same guys that... After I saw that video, I looked up David Wilkerson, then I saw Leonard Ravenhill, then I saw Tozer, and I'm like, oh, that's the same guy Pastor Joe Schimmel always quotes too. And it just seemed like for me that the heartbeat, it seems very similar to people who just love the Word of God and, and love these guys. And what was it that, that when you were watching that sermon from, uh, from David Wilkerson that said, we, I need to take this, I need to make this short clip, maybe put some music to it and people will listen? That's a good question. Uh, it's sometimes hard to get back into those exact moments where you make decisions like that. But, you know, there's in, in the beginning when when we were starting Ellerslie, uh, we stumbled across this phenomenon of sticking a, a movie score behind preaching and preaching, you know, with the Holy Spirit infused into it is something very rare, I think, for this world to hear to start with. And when you stick a background score behind it, something special happens. And we discover that, I would say accidentally, I don't, I don't, even if I tried to describe the heritage to that, but uh, I don't remember how we ended up with uh, Call to Anguish, but that one had had a significant impact on me. And as, as you can tell why, you know, it's, it's a deeply stirring. And, and when you hear a strong man weep, because of his longing uh, to have the gospel communicated to the lost. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's just so rare in our days that it was just like, okay, that needs to be uh, sponsored. That needs to be pushed. And so in addition to the ones we were doing just with our own messages, uh, we had a few like that and called the anguish, of course, just sort of took off and had a big impact. Yeah. And like I said, an impact in my walk and I've I mean, coming across a number of believers that that really did have a major impact, and it really did have uh, just a time where their thoughts were brought captive to the obedience of Christ, where they said, wow, we need to make this thing more serious. And so that's one of the great reasons I wanted to have you on was because of the impact I saw that was having. And I want other people, and maybe you don't even know the face behind it, you just saw the video, and I saw other people made different versions of it and so forth. But I did always love the fact you made a number of videos like that, including you did the gospel, and I have to say, I have a son that is very imaginative. He's eight years old. His name is Eli, and he is way more imaginative than my wife or I. We're more logicians, 
And my son is not like that. But when I shared him that video, and if you guys haven't seen it, we're going to put a link in the description because you need to see it. Um, you don't just end at the cross. Uh, you know, you, you, you preach the gospel and you, you express the gospel in maybe the first three or four minutes of the video. And then it really starts from there. And I want to know maybe, you know, your heart's desire of what you were trying to communicate rather than me try to put the words into your mouth in the gospel call that we're given. Oh, yeah. Well, that's there. there's a lot about that video, which is deeply significant in my life. Uh, and it's interesting, that little clip, which I think is 11 minutes, uh, came out of a 20 minute clip. Uh, and it was one of my sort of my armor bearers here, Nathan Johnson, that actually took that 20 minutes and consolidated it down to 11. Uh, but that was actually an orientation, if you could believe it, that was orientation for a semester at Ellerslie where we're going through some of the key things and it, it, it establishing language for what we are going to go into. And one of the most important things for me, it's a deep burden for me, is that the majesty of what Christ has accomplished not be diminished in the least. And it's just very easy for us as the body of Christ to look at the cross, look at the redemptive work of Christ, and just call it forgiveness. It's like, okay, there we go. What, Christ, what did Christ do for us? Well, he forgave us our sins so that when we believe upon him, we can now be saved and have eternal life with him. Well, praise God that that's true. However, that's the beginning of what Christ has accomplished. In other words, he had to accomplish the forgiveness part so that he could bring us into his throne room of grace, so that he could actually use us as his very clothing in this earth, as his mobile holy of holies filled with the Holy Spirit so that the power of the gospel could actually be conveyed to a lost and dying world. And so attempting to articulate that, of course, that's what that little metaphorical picture is that uh, that gospel video is, is made up of. Uh, it stems out of that, just a deep passion to see the church not stop short. It's like if we were talking about the recipe for a loaf of bread, and we said, bread is made of flour. And I'd say, it is. That's true. But are you going to finish? What else is it made of? And I think that's the way I feel with the gospel. It's like the gospel is made of forgiveness. It's like, well, yes, yes. Yes, and what else is in it? This is good news, and it's good news more than just the fact that we are forgiven, but that we are rescued. We are set, our feet are set on something solid. We are brought into the very throne room of grace, and the Holy Spirit is now given to us to live inside of us. And we are given the commission of the Most High to go into all this world with His power, with His ability, and shine forth the light of Jesus. Oh, that's good news. <laughs> no, I love that. And one of the things I love about that video is you're using, like you said, this like, you know, almost a movie behind the story as well. And for my son, him watching that, his eyes were just, he, and I had him, hey, explain this back to me. So, so we have a better understanding. And he is one of those people. And, and I'd love, I guess this is a great transition because we do ministry together as a family. My, my, all four children, my wife, we all travel and when we go, it doesn't matter if we go to Costa Rica, Israel, so forth, our kids follow. And I've noticed uh, with your ministry as well, and what you are doing is that your wife is keenly involved, uh, you know, your family's involved. What is it like? And, and I guess I would say, how has the Lord pushed you to make sure that your wife and your family is in part of all the ministry that God has for you? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I grew up at the the front end of a flailing Christian model, which was losing a lot of the kids. And so, uh, you know, it's a high percentage. I don't, I don't know what George Barna came to is something like 70 or 80% of those raised in the church at the time I was graduating high school, 80, 70 to 80% of them were actually abandoning their faith by the end of their freshman year. So I was right in the cusp of that. And I, I could actually totally understand why, because the version of Christianity that we grew up in was powerless and oftentimes was an external husk and of truth. And it didn't have the interior that was transformed by God. And so as a result, it had a, had a falseness uh, to it. And one of the other things is that a lot of the men in ministry 
uh, had a disconnect from their wives and their kids. And so as a result, you had this failing of Christian leadership as well, of adulterous relationships. And you had uh, children oftentimes known as the PKs or the MKs, if it was missionary kids or pastor's kids, that oftentimes were the worst of kids because they were disconnected from the ministry as opposed to the ministry was an extension of them. They shared in it. And this was something that my family, when I was radically coming to Jesus, we began to practice. So even before you know I got married, that my family, my parents and us, we all were sort of being revived. We were all seeing something, thanks to sort of what my sister started with her mission's passion. And my parents even went off to missionary school. My brother and I went over to Eastern Europe. We were all in in ministry uh, together, and we decided, let's do this as a family. Because I used to always resent my mom's ministry to the down and outers. They would come in, and she would give them my bed. And I would come home from school and be like, hey, who's this on my bed? It's like, hey, the person just needs you know a place to rest. I'm thinking, well, use someone else's bed, not mine. So I would resent it instead of participate in it. And one of my desires, as I'm guessing with you, Chad, is that our children would never resent ministry, resent the good news because it took them away from their parents, but that they would delight in sharing it because it was a part of their family, that they grew in strength in relationship with their dad and with their mom because of the gospel as opposed to the antithesis. And so like one of the things that I'm laboring for, and it's it's a balance uh, in that because especially when you have young kids, Ministry is a very unique thing, and it can be very taxing. It has a lot of trials and a lot of challenges, and a lot of people, uh, you know, especially when you're front lines and you're high profile, uh, want to get to your kids. And so it's it's a unique balance of protection and yet integration. And you know, right now I'm laboring to actually bring my family to the northern part of our campus. We have a campus in Windsor, Colorado, and actually establish that as our our base so that my kids actually are integrating into all day long every day. And this becomes their ministry very specifically. They already feel that way at a certain degree, but I want to integrate it even more. And so, or they're helping in the kitchen where they're helping, you know, already Hudson is our tech guy, who's my oldest son. And he does all of our filming and things like that. And it's, it's really been a special bond that has already been created, but that's the motive. I would say Chad is desiring to change patterns from a previous generational pattern to a new generational pattern that says, okay, we're not sending our kids off to boarding school because we want to be radical missionaries. We want our kids to be radical missionaries with us. Easier said than done, but that's, I think, the burden that we share. Now, amen. I couldn't agree more. It's so funny, you know, listening to your story about coming back and having someone on your bed. We actually, oh man, I'm kind of almost embarrassed to tell this story, but we uh, we took in uh, somebody uh, that was an old friend of mine back from my partying days before I knew Christ. And he was on and off drugs, and we gave him our house, and he was actually able to have his first Christmas with, with his family in a number of years. And eventually it came to a point, it was a long course of time, but it came to a point where I was like, hey, you know what, you're not getting off these drugs and alcohol, so forth, so it's just going to be, I'll still bring you food and I'll take you to the local Christian drug rehabilitation that I'm teaching at, but, you know, i just going to have to have you ask you to leave. And then about a month later, uh, he saw pictures of us in Israel, and him and seven people moved into our house while we were away. And when we came back, all of our children's presents uh, that they had gotten not too many months before, and a lot of their stuff was stolen. And a lot of people looked at us and said, how, how could your children, would they ever forgive you? And I was like, you don't understand. They saw that and they saw the damage uh, that drugs and alcohol and what it does. And when Satan really takes over a person that way, um, they got to see that damage, and they're the first people to pray for him that he would quit drinking alcohol, and, and we don't keep it hidden from them. We let them know uh, what's going on. So I, I just respect that, and I love that. And you brought up Hudson, and for anyone who's watched the message, and I've shared it, I don't even know how many times, but depraved indifference. The message yeah. that you, I don't know if that was the name of the entire message, but at least the clip that you have online. And yeah. that one is really hard to watch without being brought to tears, and I love the analogy you use in that. And then when you bring it to life, and like you said, now, you know, if I'm watching the video, I'm thinking Hudson's like this four-year-old, right, in, in my mind. And it's still that way, even if I watched it earlier today. He's still a four-year-old, and now he's your tech guy. But I'd love for you to, to give that example maybe to someone right now, because I think 
that what you guys are doing as a family, and this is a heart's passion for my wife and I, uh, my oldest brother and my youngest sister were adopted, and uh, adoption is really, really important. Uh, I believe in it should be for the Christian. And depraved indifference is one of the most powerful messages I've heard online regarding adoption. I'd love for you to give that a little synopsis of it here for us. Well, it's interesting that that particular message. Uh, I don't. I don't know that it even had a title. I title every one of my messages, but that was uh, for a pro-life rally out in Santa Barbara with a bunch of wealthy people in the audience. And I was, I flew into uh, an airport. I can never know which one's John Wayne, which one's Bob Hope. They both get mixed up in my brain, but it was in California. And I flew in and I had an hour or so drive to Santa Barbara. And I felt like God was saying, change your message. And uh, uh, you never like that when you're a speaker. And, but you know, hey, God's in control. And I've told him that many times. And he, he's asked me to do it many times. And on the drive there, that's when this message is formed, which we know is depraved indifference. That's oftentimes what it's called because of the short film. But it was not well received. Uh, that's the other interesting thing about it. It was so moving to me. Everything about that, like what you're describing, that's how it impacted me too. Les and I have four adopted kids, and this message is so critical to us where the mental picture, I had been on the on a, on a phone call with uh, someone from Liberia, a missionary from Liberia. She was just pleading for help. And she was, she, they had got a home down there uh, that could sleep around, I don't know, it's like 18 kids. And after the first week or two, they already had 27. And they were doing their best to say no to more people coming in, but they, they were having a, a tough time. They couldn't meet the demand of need. And she says, for instance, there's a four-year-old kid right down the road, sitting on the side of the road, no parents, no food, just starving to death. And I don't have hands and feet. I can't do anything to help them. And so I was burdened by that. Of course, who wouldn't be? You know, you hear that, you're like, oh, that's terrible. But then I went back to my normal work that day and just totally forgot about it. You know, you're, you're grieved and it's a bad thing, but you move on. And when I was sleeping that night, uh, I, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I had this four-year-old in my brain uh, right in front of me. I could just almost see him. And it was as if God was saying to me, what about this child? And, you know, I'm just thinking... Uh, you know, oh, it's just so bad. But then I had this thought, what if that was Hudson? Uh, and if that was Hudson on the other side of the world, sitting on the side of the road, uh, you know, I would, I would do whatever it took to get to him. I would spend all my resource. I would, if I couldn't get there, I would call up a friend, any, anyone who would just go and give food to my son, give him protection, give him someplace to sleep. And I felt like, God made it very clear, Eric, that is my Hudson. And that will stop anyone's heart beating for a moment. Because when you begin to recognize the deep bond that I or you have with your children, and to recognize what we would do and the links we would go to to rescue them or supply for them if they were ever in need. And here God has his children, and he's looking for someone who will be willing to carry his burden, to carry his heart for this unknown child on the side of the road in Liberia. And of course, that's a little overwhelming when you think it too. But at the same time, when you begin to awaken to that, it's risky, yes, but it's right. And I think for all of us as Christians to allow that to begin to percolate deeply. I've run into so many people all over the place that have, have adopted children named Hudson uh, because of that uh, short film. And so it's a little, I don't know if it's awkward for Hudson <laughs> that there's all these adopted kids named Hudson, but it's pretty special uh, to think that God used something where I was speaking at a pro-life rally and God has used it for adoption, which I think is just profound. He used it for adoption in my life too. Even though it wasn't even well received in the moment, it's it's been profoundly impacting to so many. Yeah, I think it's one of the most watched videos on the Ellerslie Mission is it Mission Discipleship? Is that is that what it is on the, the YouTube channel? Um, I, Ellerslie it, Mission uh, Discipleship Ellerslie Evangelism. Society or Ellerslie Discipleship Training. Yeah, I, you, you might know better. I don't go to my own YouTube account and watch uh, very— I probably should, so I'd be more prepared for a question like that. <laughs> we'll put a link in the description, so it won't it'll make it easy, even if I can't get things uh, precisely right. But I, I want you guys to check it out. It's one of the most watched videos on there. And I love that because 
you know, your uh, adoption experience as a believer, I mean, I just want to point, put this out there, and then I, I want, I would love for you to talk about this a little bit, because I really, really, it, it is my, my, my passion to cry out to believers that we should be the ones adopting children and raising them in the Lord. And I, I would love for someone, because I believe you have four, is it four adopted children? Is that correct? We're adopted children, yeah, and so six total. Six yes. total, four adopted children. Um, I would love for you to maybe right now on, on our show, just express to somebody maybe some of the blessings and some of the things that may be difficult as well, but uh, maybe some of the blessings about adopting and why a Christian family, people who love Jesus Christ, why they should be in the adoption business. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, sometimes I think it, it should just be obvious to all of us that, you know, God being a father to the fatherless and he puts solitary, the solitary in families, as it says in Psalm 68, 5, that he would choose our families, <laughs> that, that we should recognize that, that if he's going to stick the solitary in families, whose family is he putting them in? And so that our families are the most ripe and ready for such a such a situation. I, I remember the thought of World War II in Holland, uh, where this is a Corey Ten Boom story, where she talks about her I don't know, cousin Peter, uh, who heard about an orphanage with a hundred Jewish uh, infants uh, that were going to be killed the following morning. That the uh, Gestapo was going to go and literally just kill these uh, infants that were all they were all orphans. And so he heard about this and he got a whole bunch of his, his buddies uh, together and they all stole uh, Gestapo uniforms and went in and rescued a hundred babies. And then they distributed them into Christian homes in Holland. And I, I've had the thought many times that if someone had a hundred little infants that and came to our church on Sunday, would we have homes to stick those hundred or Jewish orphan children in. Uh, I mean, I, the church just isn't wired to do that uh, anymore. And I, I think I just would want to pause on that and say, whatever that is that is keeping us from being ready, we need to allow the Spirit of God to touch that. And that's what he's done in Leslie and I. And there are such beauties in adoption and such challenges in it. But didn't I just describe the Christian life uh, right there? You see, <laughs> In everything we do, there's inconvenience when we're obedient. And inconvenience is part and parcel of the Christian life. That when you say no to the inconvenient, you're actually saying no to the Spirit of God. When you say yes to the Spirit of God, you're actually indirectly saying yes to inconvenience. And that's important for us to remember as American Christians, we're so used to comfort and used to getting things the way we desire them, as opposed to getting them the way God would have us have them. And God isn't against inconvenience. That's sort of a shocker to many of us, but God is in the business of inconvenience. And inconvenience is actually where we discover grace at a greater level. We discover the grace of God in its beauty and its power and its might and in its consolation. And the only way to taste that is to make yourself vulnerable to that inconvenience. And so I have, we have an adoption from Korea. We have an adoption that is domestic and from down the road. And we have two from Haiti. And each of them is so uniquely beautiful and they have their unique challenges. And I would say, uh, you know, adopting from Haiti, the challenge almost more than anything was the adoption itself. It was, uh, we had a lot of corruption, a lot of challenge in that, but hey, you know, these are precious lives that even though what we went through, I would never want to go through again in getting them. They're in our home now. And what a precious treasure these two are. They're nine now the two of them. And it is beautiful. And at, at certain times, I, I feel like I have adopted Haiti into my home. And some of the Haitian behaviors and the sins of Haiti are very different than the sins of America. Like the things I do, I did when I was young, I look at Hudson and I, I mean, yeah, I did that too. Yeah, I did that too. When I look at Reese and Lily, I'm like, no, nope, never did that. No, nope, never did that. And that can be unique because in a sense, you almost have a special grace as a parent for your own foibles growing up and you don't have the same grace and understanding for Haitian foibles. And so it's actually been really good for me to recognize God's grace because God doesn't have the same foibles that we do. And yet God as a parent is able to show and express that grace uh, to us. 
And so there's a lot that you learn through adoption. Uh, it's just amazing. There's a there's a film coming out. It's the Kendrick's next uh, film, and it's a documentary, and it's coming out September 10th, I believe. So just in uh, over a week, uh, and uh, from when we're doing this this filming right now. But uh, it is it's called Show Me the Father. Wow, uh, to get a real glimpse of adoption that will do it. And so I highly encourage it. It is one of the most moving films. I'm not getting any kickbacks uh, in saying this, by the way. <laughs> it is one of the most moving films I have ever seen in my life. And just bring a box of tissues with you, because uh, when you discover the father heart and how God works that out through his body, it is utterly profound. I'm excited to, uh, for everyone to see that. Wow, I think that is amazing, bro. And and. I, I just want to encourage everyone. I, I really do believe this is uh, something. I, I praise God that uh, for those who follow Islam, that that was outlawed by Muhammad. Uh, adoption was outlawed by him because I'm so excited that Christians should be the one at the forefront of adoption. We should be the one bringing them in because guess what? We are. <laughs> We're adopted as sons. We're going to cry out, Abba, Father. You know, that's that's who we are. So just so awesome, brother. And, and, I, and I love the fact and I, I'm just thinking along these lines because I can't imagine my wife is going to hear this and be like, all right, we're ready. Let's do this, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. In fact, before we were ever together, we both said, yeah, I, I want to adopt one day. And then now we've had we pretty much my poor wife has either been pregnant or nursing until right now uh, for the first time in, in our marriage. But um, we're finally have a little bit of a, a break. But it is a it is a passion for us to try to get more Christians to really see the need and once recognizing the need, realize that they also can partake in this wonderful, beautiful thing. So I love that you're encouraging people to do that. And I want to ask a little bit, because I know I already asked about being involved with the family, but you have a wife. I know she helps do the podcast show that you guys have as well sometimes when you're not there and, and so forth. And I have a wife that is a wife of the Word, knows the Word, loves discipling women uh, in the Word, and is just amazing, amazing. And so... I don't mind bragging about my wife, but I would love to give you a chance as well for people to see as well. It's something that's beautiful when you are able to do ministry, not only alongside of your family as a whole, we already talked about that, but also specifically alongside your wife, Leslie, as well. Yeah, yeah. it's it's uh, it's a privilege of privileges. I, I love how God has bit, built our marriage and built our ministry out of that uh cohesive unit. Uh, Less than I have recognized, because we've tried to be more efficient. It's like, okay, how about I do this over here? You do this over here. It's like, hey, we can, you know, sort of kill two birds with one stone. We just work better when we're working together because we we blend uh, gifting so beautifully. And I need Leslie now for everything I do. I hardly can figure out my calendar unless Leslie is uh, telling me what to do that day, which is a funny thing how that can happen in marriage. I can't even find anything in the refrigerator without Leslie's help. So <laughs> it is funny. I think before I was married, I used to be able to do both and now I can't do either. But uh, she is a, a truly remarkable woman. She is uh, an amazing communicator, even though uh, she really doesn't like having to communicate. I think she would prefer just being a mom. Uh, but she, her, her podcast, she has a podcast. I think it's called the Set Apart Girl Podcast. Is more popular than my podcast. Uh, she is one of the most in demand. She says no to almost every speaking invite she gets, uh, and just because she knows, she knows where she's supposed to be right now, and that's at home. And so Ellerslie gets uh, El- gets Leslie. Basically, you know what most people can't access, which is Leslie. And so becoming a student at Ellerslie, you at least get uh, some training from from Leslie, which is a pretty uh, prized thing uh, these days. But she has a magazine. She's a remarkable woman. Even when she has is raising six kids, she has a magazine, she has a podcast, and she teaches at Ellerslie in her spare time. And so, and she fills in for me, like you were saying, on my podcast. And she can whip together a message in seconds is the way I would say. Just, she's like, what do you want me to talk on? And then she's suddenly just ready. It's like, okay. And uh, she she's one of those ladies that remembers everything she hears. So if she, if she, if I say something 20 years ago, she could quote me today, which of course has gotten me into some trouble. You know, you said this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's also a tremendous blessing because when she hears audiobooks, she could quote basically the whole thing to me. She's like, here's a good quote for you, Eric. <laughs> I'll always ask her, it's like, what? 
What's the scripture that is said? And she'll just tell me. So uh, what do I do without Leslie? She's she's gold. <laughs> Praise God, you know, having my wife read my articles and then getting my grammar fixed over and over has always been uh, a difficult issue. Uh, but yes, I think I have the same issues that you have, you know, great at, at speaking, same thing. And then, you know, uh, when it comes to remembering things as well, I'm, I'm good with you know, especially addresses and scripture and so forth. But yeah, in terms of, no, you said this, I'm like, oh, that you, you're, I'm sure you're right. I'm not, you know, <laughs> so I've, I've definitely, definitely been there. And this brings up such a, a, a great topic. And uh, for me personally, I, I had told you before we re- recorded as well, that already I felt a bomb with you. We have a mutual friend in Ben Price uh, out in Australia, good brother in Christ, but also the fact that my wife had read the book that you wrote alongside your wife called When God Writes Your Love Story. And praise God for, you know, thank you, Lord, that she was actually in a relationship. It was a believer. He was a great guy. I actually used to go out doing evangelism with him and stuff as well. But after reading that book, I don't know what you wrote in it, but after reading that book, she had left him, and within a couple months, we were actually together. But I wanted to talk about that book because... When God writes your love story, it, it, as I said, obviously it has great importance to me, but writing alongside your wife, you just mentioned, uh, what kind of benefit was that to be able to not just write a story about, you know, maybe, you know, two people coming together uh, and eventually being married and so forth, but writing it alongside your wife? Yeah. Uh, writing a book with someone is a unique uh, exercise that uh, taxes you in a way. I remember my dad used to say, if you really want to get to know your wife, wallpaper with her. That was like my dad's motto uh, growing up. And then I remember I corrected that when I was first married to Leslie. And I said, if you ever want to really get to know your wife, write a book with her because writing styles are so distinct and yet you need to convey something mutually at the same time. So we were doing, we recognized that we couldn't work on the same chapter together. That didn't work. In other words, it had to be an Eric chapter. It had to be a Leslie chapter. It had to be her voice or my voice. It couldn't be our voice. And some people have been able to figure out the our voice thing. Leslie and I specialize in knowing how each other works. And so she knows my voice. I know her voice. She knows how to help me edit my voice. I know how to help her edit her voice. And so we go back and forth chapter wise, which is sort of what we're known for. And the same thing we do in speaking. It's she's speaking or I'm speaking. We can't, you know, both have the same message. And so she'll have a message like one of the ones we do here during a semester is fortification. It's her message, but she invites me to speak with her. So I'll be up there with her, but it's her keynote. It's her message. And then she invites me in by asking me questions. The same thing is true in the inverse. And so part of it is just knowing how you work with someone. But for Leslie and I, I think we still hold the record for the most books written together as a couple in our 20s. And so uh, we have 28 books now. We've really slowed down on the books. Most of those were written probably in our 20s. Uh, And we now don't produce as many books as we do messages. So we have online courses, we have podcasts and things like that, which I feel like are a book. Every time I give a sermon on a Sunday, which is almost every single week of the year, it's like a book to me. And so I don't write as many books as much as I do messages. And But she's a big part of that. Everything we do, we do together. And it's a very, very special thing that we have creatively. We both are very creative in our nature and we both love communication. Uh, and so it's it's been a, a very precious bond between us. You know, I, I would love to get a little more insight also on the, I guess, the founding and also what's going on now and, and so forth. So feel free to speak as long as you want on this. But Ellerslie Mission Society, you have it there in Windsor, Colorado, right? And yes. you also have Ellerslie Church, which is obviously connected. What I mean, how did this whole thing start? What is it? What's going on in Colorado? <laughs> <laughs> so one of my passions, Leslie and I used to be, you know, sort of the best selling authors that were also speakers. And so we traveled the world, did tours and spoke. And one of the things that we witnessed as we spoke, which was very hard for us, was the fact that people would radically give their life in response to what we were sharing. And we'd get done with a message and just almost the whole uh, auditorium, the whole arena would be on their face. And we saw a mighty move of grace. And yet there was no discipleship. There was nothing. They just sort of go on their way from there. and we're, We leave town. And this burdened us because we felt like, were we really helping 
if all we did was set people up uh, with this high vision of what it means to follow Jesus, but without any infrastructural support to help them gain the understanding of how to do it in practicality. It's like having a plot of land and a whole bunch of wood and all the tools to build the house, but no one ever teaching you how. And so you're like, God, here's my land. And yes, I want to build this great house for you, but have no idea how it's built and the fact that it's actually the Lord that builds the house. And here's how these tools work. And here's where this lumber goes. And here's how it all fits together. That's our passion. Our passion is what we call discipleship. And uh, I'm not the only one that calls it discipleship. God calls it that too, but it's a rare word today. We use words like mentoring and life coaching, but discipleship is sort of the old school way of uh, building a house. As Paul calls himself a master builder, that's sort of what we are in the business of, is actually training the body of Christ in foundations on up and how it works, how you think, how you reason, how you functionally handle your thought life, how you functionally have faith and believe in Christ and believe his promises and what that looks like, how you functionally pray. We don't just say, uh, you know, hey, you need to uh, be saved by grace through faith. We teach you what grace is. We teach you how faith functions. We teach you the mechanics of what to do in this body in response to the grandeur of Jesus Christ. And it works. It is an extremely profound process. And that's what we do here at Ellerslie. So Ellerslie Discipleship Training is either comes in the one-week package or the five-week package. And uh, it is a very, very successful model that oftentimes sponsors lifelong missionaries. So a lot of people that come through here, we it's not just young people. We have uh, a lot of uh, older uh, people like pastors on furlough will come through. Missionaries when they're back in the States will come in. They just want to be grounded. They want to be rooted. They want to be uh, sound. They want to be strong. And that's what we specialize in. We'll oftentimes say, hey, we're going to hand you a, a tool belt and we're going to stick a whole bunch of tools in it, in it. And we're going to teach you how to use those tools. And then we're going to go with you when you go back home. And we're going to stay with you and, and make sure you're using them correctly and just encourage you along the way. And so our goal isn't to be the end, but to be a thoroughfare through which people, a catalyst through which people can gain new strength, new vision, and practical help in knowing how to live a strong, triumphant version of Christianity. No, I love that. And, you know, I was looking at your guys' website. As you said, you offer these one week, these five week courses and stuff. And I know, I'm sure with uh, COVID 19 and everything, things must have changed a little bit in terms of people wanting to come out and so forth. But what would it look like for someone now? Let's say now, not on a normal non-COVID year, I guess, or whatever's going on right now. But what would it look like for the person coming there for a week? How, I, like I show up in Colorado and, and what, what does that look like? Sure. So our week-long training is very intensive and uh, I, I love it. I mean, this type of thing is like my dream. This is what I would want to be a part of when I was young. But uh, we basically spend a week and we are going through foundations of uh, the Christian life, how it works. Again, what faith is, how grace functions, who the Holy Spirit is, how all of this interrelates with this body, this mind, this sexuality, this thought life, all of these things. And we're going to give a, a, a package of understanding in a very intensive process, all basically all day long, every day, and even in the evenings, we have different things. But it's very enjoyable. It's very fun. It's not just sitting and you know listening to a talking head. And then we are uh, going to follow that up with three months of online training, mentoring. You know, where we're each each of the students is a part of a small group, and they are going to participate with one of our teachers. Uh, or for the next three months, they're going to continue to be exercising these truths in their home environment, wherever that is. If it's a business situation, if it's a church situation, if it's a home environment, if it's a college environment. And so it's been very effective. It's interesting because we used to not do the one week because it's like, hey, that's not enough time to do anything. But what we found is the week long is very, very effective because they need to immediately put it into practice. Whereas if you spend a year somewhere and you get a whole bunch of head knowledge, and you never have to exercise it with environments that challenge it, you actually lose it easier. Whereas in this situation, it's been very effective because people get this and then they immediately have to put it into practice. And then we're working with them, constantly reminding them of these things uh, as they return home. So it's been very effective. Uh, that's I don't know if that gives you a, some insight into the week long, but I can answer specific questions if you have more though. 
Well, I'm also wondering, you know, you guys are out in Colorado. I mean, how big is this facility that they're coming on to? I mean, is it just a shack out by the woods or what do you guys got going on there? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. I don't want anyone to be thinking it's a shack out uh, by the woods. Uh, it's uh, it's a, it's like a, a small college campus. We we have 48 dorm rooms, just to give you an idea. It's not like uh, going to be one of those thousand person environments. So a typical semester is going to have right around 80 to 85 students in it. And that's at the higher end. I mean, we did have a summer semester. We have so much interest in what we're doing right now. Uh, in the summer semester, we actually had access to one of our other dorms that we usually is usually used by a different organization that works with orphans. And they, they're, Kids, because of COVID, uh, weren't here. And so we were able to have 125 over the summer, but that's highly irregular. Uh, typically, it's going to be around 80 to 85. Sometimes we get up into the 90s, but we try not to. In other words, that's our, our, our sort of our target uh, range. And uh, it's we're on a lake at the base of the mountains. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing a good sales pitch to you, but it's gorgeous. Uh, and it's just such a peaceful, beautiful environment in walking distance from two grocery stores. You know, in other words, we're not... We're not out in the middle of the boondocks, but we feel like we are uh, just because of the nature of the environment we're in. It's very set apart and other than the environment around us. And yet we are uh, we are very close to everything. And so it's actually been a really good spot uh, in northern Colorado and even uh, I would say a more COVID friendly uh, environment. And so that we've weathered that fairly well. Uh, it was challenging, no doubt, uh, this this past year having a campus environment during the midst of COVID, but we launched our first ever Ellerslie training online and had just this monstrous avalanche of interest in it in the midst of COVID. So we survived uh, that whole stretch, even though at, at first we we're like, God, what do you do? I mean, how are we supposed to do this? And he gave us wisdom and it was beautiful. No, I love that. You know, and one of the big things we believe, we want ministries we believe uh, that are doing the work of the Lord to be the ones that are best funded and, and best helped out. And then we know the Lord uh, we'll do that, and we'd love it to go to you uh, rather than somebody who's going <laughs> to throw it in the trash or use it for a private jet or something like that. So it is awesome to see the work that is being done there, and I'm so encouraged by so much of your guys' ministry. And I love, and this is why I, I think probably I love Ellerslie Mission Society and Eric, your messages, and, and why they are close to my heart is because our heart's ministry is discipleship. That's what we do. Um, the guys right now working in this office, not Tony because he's older, but the other guys, uh, the younger guys here that I'm seeing their thumbs are up. Uh, they're guys that, praise God, I've been able to disciple over the years. I come from the background of being a wrestling coach, and then I've moved that on to youth pastoral ministry and then teaching alongside and discipling these guys. So I would love to get some insights uh, from you because obviously myself, I have things I've learned along the way in terms of how I like to disciple and things that I do wrong, I'm sure. Uh, but maybe just some insights, because this is obviously your heart's passion. This is, I think, if I was summarizing from the outside looking in of what Ellerslie is, it's discipleship. And you had already mentioned that. So I, I want to know, in terms of discipleship, your biblical view on discipleship and some of the things that you have found to be probably the best, um, I guess the best piece of evidence is, or not evidence is, but best piece of advice you could give to someone who's saying, I want to disciple young men and women for the body of Christ. Sure. It's, you know, it's hard to be a street preacher if you weren't reached through street preaching. Oftentimes we come up with a thousand justifications of why we don't want to do it because it's very uncomfortable. And if you weren't personally reached that way, sometimes it's hard to get a vision for it. It's like, ah, I don't want to do that. Uh, the same thing can be true with discipleship. If you were never discipled, you don't oftentimes understand how it works, the importance of it, and why it's so significant. And when you have been discipled, it's interesting, but it establishes a pattern. It's sort of like what Paul is saying to Timothy, uh, entrust this to reliable men who may also be able to teach others. When you are entrusted with something, uh, through this, from the Spirit of God, through a, a trainer, a teacher, a, a pastor, whatever, you know, your parents, it gives you a model that you don't even realize you have until someone taps into it. And then it's like, oh, yeah, uh, this is important. You need to have this as a foundation. Foundations are very, very significant to me. Every, everyone sort of creates a different expression for how they go about uh, framing this grand thing called the Word of God. Uh, and how do you pass along something 
that you know I went through uh, the the entire Bible as as fast as I could a few months back because there's this one guy that is in my life that has gone through since January of this year he's gone through it 13 times. And it bothers me that he's uh, going through it more than I have uh, because I haven't gone through it 13 times. And my best so far is 64 days. <laughs> I can't keep up with this guy if I'm going 64 days. This is a big book. And it's uh, it's interesting because this big book, how do you impart it? How do you give the essence of it? Because that's where it starts with. It starts with the essence. And you have to know the basis, the uh, what, what I would call the key hermeneutic. Hermeneutics is a, just a huge word that intimidates most people, but it's basically the way we approach the Bible, the tools we use, and how we excavate, how we rightly handle it. The key hermeneutic of the Bible, and this is one of the most foundational things of all discipleship, you need to know what this book is about. It's about a person, and his name is Jesus. And when you know that, you actually begin to approach even the Old Testament knowing that this is about Jesus. Everything in the Bible is about Jesus. It's to help you understand him. The Bible is like a road map, or I'm sorry, a treasure map. And the entire goal of that treasure map is to get you to the treasure. If you heed it, you will always end up at Jesus. And so we describe that with five fingers. And so uh, God, no man has seen God at any time. So in his right hand is his saving hand. So here's this God who wants to save us, but he's invisible. And uh, so imagine an invisible hand and uh, an invisible hand, if it waves, you can't see it. If it points at you, it says, hey, you, it, you can't see it because it's invisible. If it beckons you to come, you can't see it. Why? Because it's invisible. So God knowing that is going to create something in the image of the invisible. It's called a glove. Let's imagine that. That's what we are as humans. We're, in a sense, a glove created in the image of the invisible. And when we submit and humble ourselves, we fit perfectly on top of this invisible. And this is what Jesus is going to do. The Word of God is basically going to clothe that which is invisible and express its movements. So when it waves, we see it. Why? Because the Word of God is expressing it. The Word of God in person. I'm sorry, the Word of God in text, which is the Bible. The Word of God in person, which is Jesus Christ. The Word of God in action which is the cross, the word of God in us, which is the Holy Spirit's indwelling, and the word of God through us, which is basically what we would term the Great Commission or missions. And so those five things are in essence what we are desiring to train the body of Christ in. Because when you know the word of God in text, the Bible, and you know the word of God in person, Jesus, and you know what he did on that cross, that is actually the basis of all faith. That's what we believe. What do you believe? Well, I believe the word of God. Well, I believe what it says is what leads to the man Jesus and what that man did on the cross. As Paul says, I decided I, I knew nothing but Christ. Sorry, guys. Uh, my first Corinthians is uh, is a little muddled right now. I determined to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. That basically, it, when you have that basis, you have Paul's basis. You have the entirety of the Old and the New Testament wrapped up in the word of God expressed. And what does that lead to? That leads to the word of God in us, the Holy Spirit moving in, empowering us to become living epistles. And then the word of God through us, those living epistles have gone mobile. And we must go and we must share this with a lost and dying world. And so when a disciple gets those five fingers, suddenly they have the basis. They have a framework of understanding of what they're here for, what to believe in, what to convey. Even though that's a very, very simple understanding, that's there's our passion here at Ellerslie. And I love it. I, I love the examples. I think they're awesome. And, you know, it's interesting that uh, we're coming up. I, I have about five minutes left with you, Eric. And sure. I, I want to ask you, you know, you did a message called The Ancient War Cry, right? And uh, I love that message. I think I shared that with my youth group some eight years ago or something. Uh, but that was great. But what I would love in this last five minutes is for you to give uh, a believer, believers, fellow believers, a war cry for going out and sharing the gospel and for discipling young men and women. I'd love that that last opportunity to throw that one at you there, uh, Mr. Wow. Ludi. <laughs> so, yeah, when the ancient war cry comes on, I haven't heard it in a while, but I remember it came on, someone was playing it, and it scared me. Uh, it's like, where's our war cry? And it's just, uh, in a sense... Every single one of us needs to have a fresh push behind our soul. The world isn't supplying it. And oftentimes the church is not supplying it. And yet the word of God is a roar. 
And when they dis, when the word of God itself describes the voice of God, it's the sound of many waters. It's like Niagara Falls. And so there's this booming voice in the scriptures that needs vent. And ironically, we're the vent. God desires to communicate something to us and to this lost and dying world. And as a result, when we recognize that we are that vehicle of delivery, and we recognize that when we keep this mouth shut, that voice, that truth is not being conveyed, it's a big deal. I'm preparing a message right now. It's a 20-part series. It's called The Daring of Stanley Dale, and it's about the 25-year uh, period of the Church of Jesus Christ reaching Erie and Jaya, or Papua New Guinea, uh, and uh, in the, the 20th century. It is so powerful. And to realize that these men and women are choosing deliberately when they're staring at these this island of New Guinea and they're recognizing the western half is basically unreached and there are cannibal tribes in the midst of it. And to get to them, you have to risk your life because these jagged rocks and these you know precipices are so dangerous, but who is going to go? Can't we just forget about them and move on? I mean, God stuck them in the middle of nowhere. I, we can't even get to them. These men and women are literally going to deliberately choose to lay down their lives to say these people must know. They are controlled by spirit bondage and demonic uh, control. They are cannibals. They are violent. They are so needy for truth, and they've never heard it. And how will they hear unless someone goes to them? And I am so stirred by that story. And I just think afresh for us as the body of Christ, COVID has dimmed us and dulled us. It's like, oh, well, you can't really speak and put the mask on. And it's like this real awkwardness when you're trying to convey truth behind a mask. And it's so critical that we do not allow the gospel fervor to be dimmed inside of us. There is a God who has rescued us and who is seated at the right hand of majesty and all things are beneath his feet. And though the devil is boasting as if he's in control down here, he is defeated. And our God has purposely chosen us of all people. He chose us as his vehicles of delivery for such a time as this. And there is no greater privilege than to be chosen by the most high to be his mouthpiece to a lost and dying world. And if that means getting uncomfortable, so be it. If that means inconvenience, so be it. If that means danger, so be it. If that means laying down our lives and suffering for the glory of Jesus Christ, it is our privilege. My my kids are into parkour. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of parkour. It's a funny uh, thing. I think it comes from France. And you create all these obstacles. And it's not just like if I was trying to get across the room, oh, I don't want to just go straight across the room. I want to jump, do some flips. I want to find the hardest way. Uh, I want to look for obstacles. Parkour looks for obstacles and then considers them delightful. Welcome to Christianity. When we see obstacles, when we see challenges, we're supposed to smile and rejoice. This is God's territory. It's an athletic event. It is truly a game in a certain way that we can smile at the whole time. Everyone on Earth in Earth's history wishes they could be alive in 2021 with the challenges we're going to be facing. This is the time we want to be here, and there is a job to do. Let's do it. Hey, man, I do know what parkour is. And <laughs> I had a couple of youth group guys a few years ago that were really into it, but... Thank you so much, Eric. It has been such a blessing to have you on and just encouraging the brethren, encourage people on adoption, encourage people to go out and share the gospel, disciple young men and women and married couples as well. And I mean, there was just so much here. It was just such a, a joy to be with you, Eric. Well, thanks, Chad, for having me. It's a delight. I'm so supportive of this ministry. You guys are just doing such a great work. Hey, thanks so much, brother. And God bless you guys for uh, sitting in with us and sharing this time with us. God bless.